the 5th of November, the Gunpowder Treason and Plot. I know of no reason why the Gunpowder Treason should ever be forgot. Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. And I have been planning in honor of Guy Fawkes Day, which I missed, unfortunately, by about two days. I was planning to talk about that most amazing movie, V for Vendetta, and the impact it had on, has had on our culture. However, I got thinking about that, and I realized there were several other movies that had kind of become memes, that had become memes with particular political significance for the current age. So, the actual title of this video is Remember, Remember, Movies That Became Memes. But before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about um, my current project, which I'm just finishing up, uh, and in conjunction with Mrs. Desperado, as usual, I have written a, or we have written a military fiction, military sci-fi, called Diana's Fury. It's an interesting female-centric uh, novel. It posits a world where people can fly drones with their minds, but only a small number of people can do it. They have to be carefully vetted and searched for, and they're all female. And the hero is a spunky Serbian immigrant who uh, has to brave the jungles of Borneo because, because of the fast, huge bandwidth. You have to be near to the battle zone, and they're, they're down there fighting terrorists. So, we are very excited about this book, and we've decided to try to sell it to an actual publisher, other than, other than uh, Nakota Publishing, which is us, actually. And so, if anybody knows of a publisher, preferably a small one, because the big ones are kind of loath to take on new people these days, it's lucky that famous writers get, get books published, much less uh, people who are, are new to the game. So... Let us know. We're also considering the possibility of an agent, so if anybody knows a good one that's, that's um, uh, very, very aggressive, let's say, and uh, willing to take on new people who have a, a good product to sell, uh, please let us know. So, let's go back to our previously scheduled program. Uh, like I said, in honor of the 5th of November, England's Guy Fawkes Day, I was planning to talk about V for Veneta, and instead I have several movies to talk about, and uh, we have seven of them, so we got to get started here. So of course I'm going to start with Ethan for, for Vendetta, uh, and this was released by Warner, Bro Warner Brothers in 2005, uh, directed by James McTeague, and the uh, screenplay was by the Wachowskis, and if you don't know who they are, I'll go and get into that later, because they did another movie in this list. And it stars Hugo Weaving as the uh, uh, mysterious protagonist and, and Natalie Portman as his young female protege. And it's based on a graphic novel by Alan Moore with uh, David Lloyd's illustrations, published as a series from 1982 to 89 by DC's very fascinating Vertigo label. Now, the um, basically, the premise of this novel is that England has become a totalitarian state, uh, partially because of a I think, I think it's supposed to be like a bioterror attack, but there's this horrible plague, <laughs> and that sounds familiar. This uh, tyranny takes over, and uh, people are very oppressed, and this one guy, called himself V, he hides behind the Guy Fox mask because he's so been so disfigured. And he's fighting a one-man battle against the government, and he's got these plans of what he's going to do. And... So you never even see his face. You never see his face at all during during the uh, during the show. But it's kind of reminiscent of the first Guy Fox plot. He was actually a terrorist. Uh, back in 1605, he plotted with a number of other guys to blow up Parliament because they were Catholic agitators and they didn't like the fact that the England had broken with the Roman Church. And so they have Guy Fox Day to celebrate his execution, essentially. And so, in this, in this movie, they cast uh, Guy, the Guy Fawkes image as heroic and, uh, because V wears this mask. <clears throat> and as a, as a result, it's become, it's become a uh, symbol of rebellion. And in fact, the Guy Fawkes mask was adopted as a symbol by the uh, hacker group Anonymous. And so you, all, you often see that you've, uh, they've 
often show up at protests. And in the movie, there's a scene where there's all these protesters be behind these Guy Fox masks, which is pretty cool. And also, the Libertarian Party used it uh, in be on behalf of Ron Paul's uh, can uh, presidential candidacy a few years back. Uh, they had the special fundraising events on Guy Fox Day. Remember, remember, the 5th of November. And it's interesting. All these movies have some kind of conflict as far as you know politics is concerned, because. Uh, Moore is a pretty lefty guy, and he always disowns any movie that gets made out of his comics because he's he's never really happy with how they portray it. But yet it has become a uh, strong um, a strong symbol of libertarians, anarchists, and pretty much anybody of a freedom-loving streak. <clears throat> Second movie, The Matrix. I'm sure everybody's heard of this one. Uh, from released by Warner Brothers, 1999, directed and written by the Wachowskis, and this is the formerly Wachowski brothers, now Wachowski sisters, as they both transitioned, and which is why it's going to be a little bit confusing. Uh, this stars Keanu Reeves as the uh, the hero, the almost supernatural hero Neo, and uh, Lars Fitchburne is the uh, mysterious. Morpheus, and uh, and there's also Carrie, what's her name? Carrie Ann Moss, and she is the, the leather-clad uh, warrior girl, who looks pretty cool in these movies, I must say. There were two sequels made to this in 2003, and the premise of this is that this computer programmer, Thomas Anderson, otherwise known by as Neo, who's a computer hacker, he gets, uh, he keeps, he gets curious, because on the net he keeps seeing this stuff about about the Matrix, and he starts researching. And so a dude called Morpheus contacts him. Well, I guess, I guess it's, um, I guess it's Trinity, the girl, that contacts him. But anyway, Morpheus tells him that there's this. The reality is not what it seems, and he takes this red pill to see what it really is. And what happened was the world was attacked by uh, intelligent machines. AI kind of went crazy, and uh, it was devastated. So the machines put the survivors in these tanks and use the tanks to power their civilization, the minds of all these people. And they get to have this imaginary life as they do that. And so once, you see, once you've done the red pill, you can't go back to the imaginary world unless you take the blue pill. And he's pursued by Agent Smith, who's, a kind, of a, who's kind of a, um, I think he's an AI too, he's serving the machines. And he's played by Hugo Weaving. <laughs> of all people. And so, anyway, it's pretty cool. Uh, it really caught the attention of a lot of people. It was a very, a very amazing movie. And what became the meme was red pill, meaning that you're, you're awake to the reality. And it was mainly used by the populist right. And uh, they referred to people who are blue pills, who are, you know, just normies who don't understand. They've also used, invented the terms black pill and white pill to, to, um, denote pessimism and optimism, respectively. Uh, it may have something to do with the movie M.A.S.H. as well, because the black pill was a, a pill that they made up as a suicide pill. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's another matter. Now, it's interesting because the Wachowskis, who, being transgender and from Hollywood, who have to be, must have to be far left, I know one of them claimed that, no, The Matrix is actually about transgenderism. Which, to me, seems like, it's kind of like uh, being disgruntled. Oh, all these right-wing people like our movies, so we better school them. And, you know, it just doesn't fit too well, unless this huge conspiracy is intending to, you know, use the wrong pronouns and divine them access to the women's bathroom, and that sort of thing. No, I think there's a lot of good movies about transgenderism that I may talk about at some other time. Uh, you may be surprised that... that at least one of these is among my favorite movies. Uh, but anyway, so I think that's a little bit of sour grapes, but it, it shouldn't be because it's a very popular movie, and I'm sure they made a lot of money off of it. And I've also said that, uh, especially beginning in my review of Watership Down, that I think authors often have ideas in the back of their minds that I don't even consciously know. I know I, some of my work's been viewed in that way. People have said, oh, this means this, and I thought, oh, gee, I didn't even think about that when I was writing it. 
third movie, They Live. Universal Pictures, 1988. Director, director and the screenplay and the screenwriter were both John Carp Carpenter, who's known famous, he's famous for, you know, cheesy sci-fi and horror films. And this movie stars uh, Roddy Piper, yes, the professional wrestler, uh, Keith David, and Meg Foster. It's based on a obscure sci-fi story called Eight O'Clock in the Morning by Ray Nelson Witten back in 1963. I didn't know that. I'm, I'm going to have to look this up. Now, this movie, there's a there's this homeless drifter called Nada. That's that's Roddy Piper, and he comes into he comes into the city, and weird things are going on. I mean, there's that somebody takes some hacker takes over the TV and says that aliens are you know controlling our minds, and uh, then there's a church guy handing out pamphlets. The same kind of deal. Uh, Nada, which is means nothing. The, the drifter, which is what they call the drifter, he goes to this church and is raided by police. But he does manage to snag a pair of sunglasses that they have. These bins of sunglasses. And he, when he puts one on later, he escapes the police. Obviously, when he puts one on later, he sees that the world is not what it seems. It's, it's all like black and white and. Uh, Half the people around uh, look like monsters. They have these skull faces. And those are the aliens that live among us. And uh, all these signs everywhere, especially billboards, say things that are subliminal, like, Obey is the big one. And that's become the meme. A big sign that just says, Obey. And things like, Consume. Uh, consume, purchase goods, reproduce, all that stuff. <laughs> and uh, so he becomes, Nada becomes part of the resistance against these aliens. And uh, part, of the, part of the plot is interesting because the aliens come from a warmer world and so they're behind global warming because they want to turn the, the world into a hothouse like their own home. Now, so it's become very popular, especially among the populist right, especially among people who resist COVID restrictions and that sort of thing. So you see the, the sign obey all the time. You see pictures of the skull people. You see some of the other weird, funky signs like consume and so on. It's definitely become a meme. Uh, Carpenter would probably be intrigued by that because at the time he said that the movie was about Ronald Reagan, who a lot of, like a lot of Hollywood people really hated him, and the the uh, over the excessive power of corporations. Now, I personally think Ronald Reagan was a pretty good president. However, I think Carpenter was right about con about corporations and and succeeding presidents, especially especially uh, like Bill Clinton and so on gave corporations more and more power. He had a, a very good point there when he said that. Movie a number, what is this, number four, Braveheart, Paramount, 1995. Director, Mel Gibson, screenplay, Randall Wallace, who is no relation to the principal character, uh, starring Mel Gibson as the, as the hero, uh, William Wallace, who is a historical character, also known as Braveheart, and Patrick McGowan is the bad guy, uh, the King of England. And this was based on a book called The Wallace by Blind Harry, whoever that is. This is a historical movie about the life of Scottish rebel Sir William Wallace. And it's, basic, it's based loosely on history, uh, because in 1280, in 1280, uh, the king of Scotland, Alexander III, had, had died without an heir. And so the king of England, Edward, called Longshanks, decided to invade. And it was a, they succeeded and it was an oppressive rule. William Wallace was a kid at the time, and he was like a noble, but he was a kid. And he fled with his uncle to Europe. And later on he returns, marries his childhood sweetheart, and she is basically... Uh, raped and killed by the English, so he swears revenge, and he also swears to get people for his get freedom for his people. And this is where the themes come in. You'll see Mel Gibson in blue face paint, which is kind of one of the memes. Uh, some of the libertarians I've known have, have actually worn this uh, to conventions and to protests and so on, as kind of a we're tough and we're free type of uh, type of signification. And also the cry freedom, which. Uh, you know, um, Wallace cries as he's being tortured by the English because he won't bend, he won't stop. And uh, it, it's interesting because this movie 
uh, in Wikipedia you'll see, oh, it was so historically inaccurate. It was the most historically inaccurate historical film ever. And uh, I'm kind of a history buff, and I've noticed inaccuracies in dozens of movies. So I think this is actually more about who made the movie. <laughs> Mel Gibson, uh, very conservative, uh, very controversial. Uh, and uh, he got into, his mouth gets into a lot of trouble because he says things that may possibly be true but aren't very popular to he for people to hear. So they picked on everything. Like they said, oh, well, Scotsmen didn't wear kilts and they didn't have bagpipes back in, in the 13th century. And that may be true, but who can possibly imagine Scotsmen without kilts and bagpipes? So I think if Gibson was a typical Hollywood liberal, they would have been a rake. Anyway, definitely, definitely become a meme with political significance. Next movie is one that was kind of a cult, became a cult favorite after failing in the box office. Idiocracy. Uh, 20th Century Fox, 2006. This director, director was Mike Judge, and the screenwriters were Mike Judge and Eaton Cohen, who is no relation to the brilliant Cohen brothers from Minnesota. He's actually from Israel. It is this Cohen. And uh, stars Luke Wilson and Maya Rudolph. It is. It may have been inspired by a sci-fi movie, a sci-fi story I read a long time ago, uh, *The Marching Morons* by C.M. Cornbluth, which was published way back in 1951. And uh, this is a loony comedy. It's kind of a cautionary tale about the this this genetic effects of modern civilization, how. Um, Smart people are responsible. They use birth control and have few kids. Uh, dumb people have as many kids as they they want, often accidentally. And so soon the dumb people outline, outnumber the smart people. And so the premise, the, the plot is that um, Luke Wilson, uh, as Corporal Joe Bowers, is in the army and he's selected for this experiment. They're going to put him, they're going to freeze him for like two years or so and bring him out. And they select him because he's perfectly average, absolutely 100 IQ, and just and just not not bright, not dumb. And uh, they don't find a suitable candidate among the women. Uh, and instead, they pick a prostitute, probably just probably because the guy who's doing it knows this prostitute. And that's that's Rita, played by by Rudolph. They are accidentally left in there for 500 years, and when they come out, the world has become a disaster. In fact, uh, uh, Luke's capsule or whatever it is, or, or excuse me, Joe's capsule or whatever, it could, slides out of a pile of garbage that's like a mountain. <laughs> and uh, people are so dumb, you know, they, they're only into consumption and they, they can barely read and write and, they, and uh, everything's very low vile and crude and, and there's an ecological disaster and the crops are all failing. And so, and they have a... Uh, professional wrestler as president of the U.S. And eventually, Joe Bauer, because he's so smart, he comes to the attention of this president, and they put him in the cabinet. And the first thing he addresses is the crop problem. He says, what, why are the crops dying? We water them with Brondo. It's got what plants crave. Says, what is Brondo? Well, Brondo turns out it's a sports drink. <laughs> and... Uh, they have, they're so dumb they think a sports drink will make plants grow. And of course, it's actually, you know, poisoned the soil with too many minerals. And uh, that's why the crops are failing. He says, so why don't we, why don't we water it with water? You mean like from the toilet? <laughs> so, and what do you know? The crops start growing again. And pretty soon he becomes president himself. Joe does. He's the smartest man on earth. And and his, his new wife, Rita, is the smartest woman on earth. Now, this has become a meme for both the right and the left. Anybody who thinks the other side is really stupid. <laughs> and uh, it's funny because Mike Judge, although he seems pretty conservative, if you've ever seen some of his, like, Beavis and Butthead is the satire on these dumb teenagers, and he also did my King of the Hill, which kind of, the hero is this very conservative Texan guy, um, Hank Hill. So anyway... But yet he he's compared Trump to the wrestler president and, and said that it was idiocracy come true soon. And I think it's probably just, he's probably just joining into the Trump derangement syndrome because Trump, for what, you know, you can love him or hate him, and he may be crude, but, you know, somebody, he didn't get to where he is by being dumb. Absolutely not. 
So the memes in this case are some of the great lines from the movie, especially like Brondo, that's what plants crave, and uh, like water from the toilet. <laughs> and there's, there's a few other ones that are, are a little bit cruder uh, in, involving like corporations from nowadays like selling sexual services as part of their... Uh, yeah, I'm not going to get into it. Next movie, it's something that, that Mrs. Desperado and I had a debate over this one. Uh, would, and I loved it, she hated it. The movie is called Fight Club, and this was released by 20th Century Fox in 1999. Directed by David Flincher, screenplay by Jim Ewells, and it's based on Fight Club by Chuck Palahniuk, uh, published by Norton in 1996. Interestingly enough, Edward Norton is one of the stars. <laughs> and Brad Pitt, and Helen Bottom Carter, all fantastic. So... <clears throat> Anyway, the idea is that, and this is kind of more of a surreal movie, not really sci-fi or history, but it takes place in the, the present day. And uh, this guy, he, the narrator, we never, I mean, we never hear his name, but people call him Jack. The fans do. And he is very disgusted. He's, he hates his job because he's, what he, he feels it's wrong. He's working for auto companies and helping them cover up horrific accidents from from uh, defective products, and he can't sleep, and all this stuff is going wrong. Then one night he's out, he leaves his apartment, and the apartment explodes. And uh, in the process of trying to find a place to stay, he meets a guy named Tyler Durden, played by Brad Pitt. And he's a real loose cannon. I mean, he's into everything. He he denounces the corporate, uh, the corporate um, greed and so on, and how they made us dumb consumers. And he talks about men, how men have to be men. And so he starts this thing called Fight Club, in which men fight each other with bare knuckles. And uh, they love it. They feel manly. They feel fulfilled. And then later on, he starts this thing called Project Mayhem, which turns out to be kind of a terrorist thing against corporations. And so there's this mystery of who Tyler Durden actually is, which is answered at the end of the movie, and uh, which is pretty weird, which is why. Well, Mrs. Despero didn't like it, but it's interesting that it, it inspired an actual, an actual fight clubs in the real world. You know, you know, illegal, unauthorized, bare knuckle boxing clubs, and at least one would be terrorist who tried to blow stuff up, like in Project Mayhem. And so this is a very popular meme, especially on the right, and uh, a lot of things have been adopted, especially the idea of Fight Club and the rules of Fight Club. Uh, Rule one of Fight Club being you don't talk about Fight Club. So that's like a, a meme or a slogan people bring up all the time. The idea of Tyler Durden and uh, his face um, all bruised up. Brad Pitt's pretty, pretty face all bruised and battered. And then, uh, and then the phrase special snowflake, which became a synonym for, you know, progressive whiners who think they're important. But the, but the phrase in there, in the movie, is you are not a special snowflake. You are not important. And which is why, you know, they hate that phrase. And, and, the, and the website, the right-leaning website, Zero Hedge, has adopted uh, Tyler Durden as his mas mascot. At least that's what they all write under that name. And uh, they, uh, their motto is, movie line for the movie, uh, as time, something like, as time increases, the life expectancy of everybody goes to zero. Very true. Uh, last but not least, The Hunger Games. And I talked about this in my uh, segment about dystopias, but it also applies here. This was released by Lionsgate in 2012. And this is a YA, basically. It was published, based on the book series published by, uh, by Scholastic, starting in 2008, written by Suzanne Collins. The director of this movie was Gary Ross, at least the first movie, and he did the screenplay along with Collins and Billy Ray, whoever that is, and uh, the stars were Jennifer Loris uh, as the brave and noble Katniss Everdeen, and uh, Joss Hutcherson as her male uh, ally, and uh, Woody Harrelson as a drunken would-be hunger gamer. Now, the premise for those of you who've been living under a rock 
<clears throat> is that uh, the, the U.S. or the world underwent this horrible famine. I think it was environmental and ecological in nature. And so this tyranny took over. They renamed the country Pan Am and divided into 13 districts, uh, and all of which, you know, have to do with a particular type of industry <clears throat> for the capital where all the rich people live. And uh, one of them rebelled. That was District 13, so they wiped it off the map. And uh, Katniss lives in, in District 12, which is like a mining district. People are, are starving. That's why they call it the Hunger Game. The government only gives them barely enough food to survive. And she sneaks out in the woods, which is illegal, to hunt uh, to f get food for her family. And so, as it happens, they the capital punishes all the districts by having each they each have to submit two teenagers every year to fight each other to death in a specially designed arena called the Hunger Games. The winner, that is the the winner of the winner of the games, the last survivor, uh, his or her district gets extra food rations for that next coming year. So that's part of the motivation that they have to do this. And so Katniss's little sister is picked by by Lot, and of course she, she would die immediately. So she volunteers, and she's actually got skills. And her her um, other a tribute from uh, District 12 is Peta. He's he's the son of a baker and not very, not all that fit. So you think he's going to buy it too? But of course, uh, Katniss proves to be resourceful and she fights against the system and and things don't turn out like the like the uh, basically scummy, uh, uh, apathetic, uh, sociopathic elites in the capital think they're going to turn out. And so it's very heroic. There was like four movies, three books, four movies. And uh, this became like another freedom meme. And one of the things they did in the movie was they started doing this hand signal. District 12 did this hand signal, which is, I'm not sure I'm doing it right. It's a lot like the Boy Scouts <laughs> sign. Uh, but it became kind of a meme. In fact, it, uh, there were these protests in Thailand uh, that the military had taken over and these people were protesting actually the government actually banned the hand signal because they didn't they felt they felt so insulted by these people rebelling and uh, certain other countries like Vietnam banned the movie entirely they were afraid that it would you know inspire people to revolt perhaps so it was definitely a powerful influence on on the need for freedom and as you can tell all these seven movies we've been talking about they all have a kind of a freedom angle to them they all have that that meme that is pro-freedom. Some are embraced by both the left and the right, some more by the right than the left, but they're all very good movies, I think, and I, and I hardly recommend them all, with various degrees of goodness, depending upon which is which. This has been my video on movies that became memes, uh, beginning, of course, with V for Vendetta. And as a, as a side, the poem that I recited at the beginning, uh, Remember, Remember, that was written by John Milton. I didn't realize that. Milton was a very famous 17th century uh, English poet, and, and he bought, wrote Paradise Lost. He was a great advocate of freedom himself. And so he got in some political trouble now and then in his in day and age. And he was born to just three years after the foiled gunpowder plot. So it's no wonder that he knew it so well. So thanks for bearing with me in my, my long and detailed but hopefully interesting segment about, about um, movies that became memes. Please let me know what you think about it in the comments below. And also like and subscribe because we do like to spread the word and get more viewers. And also remember what I told you about my upcoming book. If anybody knows and has any good contacts in the publishing industry, please let me know as well. So for now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.